should I say, lecture that Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me have prepared for you to prove to you that Jesus Christ was the fulfilling and is the fulfilling, uh, not only was, he still is, the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 17-week prophecy, as we can read of in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. As I said, this is the 10th lecture today, and uh, I like to call it a lecture because we are doing lecturing from the Bible. That's where we're stuck in for the moment in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. There we are going to continue directly in a moment, but first I want to introduce to you my wonderful brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update over there in the United States of America. And I don't know how the weather is over there, Tom. We have the midst of December. It is still plus zero degrees here, and I'm speaking Celsius, of course. But how is the weather in your uh, region? You know, winter has finally come. Hello, Yerk, and hello to the listeners. Winter has finally come to central Iowa in uh, the United States. Uh, November was a, a beautiful month. Uh, most of the weather was uh, 50 degrees and uh, more like uh, more like spring or fall than it was winter. Yeah. Now, uh, now here we are in the middle of, of December, and finally... We're getting some winter-like weather. We've got snow on the ground and 24 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And going to get down into the single digits uh, in the nighttime hours and uh, and then rise again, believe it or not, back up into the 50s before the end of the week. Oh, so my. Just unbelievable. Uh, you know, it, it, we've... A month of winter has already gone by, and uh, we haven't felt it hardly. But, That's a temperature uh, holo- uh, roller coaster you're going through there, right? Yeah, it certainly is. It certainly is. I, I tell you, uh, I always this 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 idea of global warming and stuff. It's all it's all a charade. Oh yeah. But yeah. Uh, but I always uh, playing along with the game. I always tell people, uh, I love this global warming. It just, <laughs> I wish it would warm up some more. <laughs> Anyway, I want to not correct you, but I want to make sure the listeners realize that Jesus was not only the fulfilling of the 70th week of Daniel, but the 70th week of Daniel was 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I implicated that in in what I said. That's that's right. right. There is no future seven-year period of time called the Great Tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. It's all a lie, every bit of it, and this program is dedicated to proving it from the Scriptures. 
so that everyone can see it for themselves and we can finally put a stop to the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden that has led the entire Protestant and evangelical world astray and made them prepared to unite with the man of sin in Rome, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, that, and when, when people slowly but surely begin to comprehend what we're talking about, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, and that the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan, you begin to comprehend just what the consequences are for telling the world that the papacy is not the Antichrist. It's a single individual. It comes during the 70th week of Daniel, way off in the distant future, just before Christ comes, and we can all cozy up with the man of sin in Rome. He calls himself a Christian. He worships Jesus Christ, but, but he's the leader of the Christian world. He's not the Antichrist, like the Protestant reformers said, that they were all wrong, the Protestant reformers and every Bible-believing Christian from that time 1517 A.D., all the way back to the first century, they were all wrong. Paul was wrong. The, the, yeah, Paul was wrong when he told the Thessalonians that he who replaced the, the, Caesars in Ro the Caesars in Rome would be the Antichrist. Yes, even Paul was wrong. Thank you for helping me. Yeah, we spoke about that extensively in our last broadcast when we even read the prayer that uh, Henry Gretton Gillis uh, included into his wonderful work, Romanism and the Reformation, that right. the Christians of the very first centuries, I'm not saying just the first century, but the first uh, centuries, included right. where they included the emperors and, 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 and the health of the whole uh, empire of Rome because mm -hmm. they knew when that was going to go down, when that was replaced, that would replaced it would be much much worse than the sure. world has ever seen and that's mm -hmm. the way it came not right. uh, not because prayer doesn't work but because it was already predicted that's right god who writes history before it even happens because he knows the end from the beginning he determined it that the way to be that's right and the servants of God, the body of Christ, has been under persecution from the papacy ever since its rise to power after replacing the Caesars. And uh, history leaves absolutely no room for doubt or even argument. The papacy has so perfectly fulfilled its role as the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, that no one can make a credible argument to the contrary, all right? The Protestant reformers were absolutely certain and they were unanimous in their belief that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That, that was what was believed in the non-Catholic world. That was what always was believed in the body of Christ. No matter what denomination of Protestantism or evangelicalism, that was the belief. The papacy is the Antichrist, the little horn, the man of sin. Now, why are we so stupid in our generation? Why is not this taught from every pulpit <clears throat> in every church in the world? Because it was before. Why is it no longer taught? Well, because we believed a lie. We believed a delusion. We believed the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. That the papacy is not, is not the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. No, it's a single individual. And he'll probably look a lot like Mitt Romney or somebody. Graying temples tall, dark, and handsome, very influential, king of kings and lord of lords. He'll deceive the very elect, right? He's going to do it in the span of an adult male human being. And if you believe that, I got a bridge to sell you. No single individual. Listen, as a matter of fact, it took centuries 
for the papacy to slowly grow to the status that it finally achieved during the first millennia, or after the, just after the first millennia since Christ. And that was king of kings and lord of lords. No king, no governor, no president, no potentate ever did a thing without the approval of the papacy. No king or potentate ever rose to power without the papacy's uh, uh, initiative. No king or potentate stayed on his throne and kept his crown or even the head upon his shoulders without the pope's sustenance. Okay? The governments were of, by, and for the pope. Okay? Just exactly like the early Christians predicted. And he used the kings, the governments of the world over which he ruled to persecute the saints of the Most High, to shed the blood of the saints of the Most High, to wear out the saints of the Most High, to persecute them, to massacre them, to torture them, to confiscate their property, to enrich the church and the state, to take their children and raise them up in Roman Catholic nunneries and, and orphanages, to confiscate all their properties to enrich the church. That's why the Roman Catholic Church to this day is the richest single institution the world has ever seen. The income of the Roman Catholic Church rivals that of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, tax rolls of the United States of America. Nobody knows anymore how powerful, how rich, how controlling, how persecuting, how absolutely diabolical that the, the papacy, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church itself is because we believe that lie. And we don't tell the people what control the papacy has over our government. We don't tell the people how much money, how much property, how much real estate, how much control over the Federal Reserve Bank the Vatican has. Because we believe a lie that the papacy is not the man of sin. Oh, all of our focus is on an imaginary individual that is up to this point a fiction and trust me when I tell you until Christ comes until Christ returns he will remain a fiction of evil wicked minds he does not exist the papacy is was and always will be the man of sin and if your pastor behind the pulpit of your church is not aware of these things and is not actively preaching against the man of sin in Rome and his control over our government, then he needs to be unceremoniously evicted from that precious place behind the pulpit and replaced with a true Bible-believing man of God who understands both prophecy and history. And then we'll know the truth. But the first thing to be taken out of the church will be any teaching having to do with futurism. This idea that the 70th week of Daniel is future. Because the 70th week of Daniel was Christ's ministry on the earth 2,000 years ago. To say that the 70th week of Daniel's future is to deny that Jesus was the Christ. Stop and think about it. That is the spirit of Antichrist. That's what the Bible says it is. He who denieth that Jesus had come in the flesh, the same is the spirit of Antichrist. When you say the 70th week of Daniel is future, you have denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. 
Now, let me tell you, there's consequences for that. This phony fulfillment of a future 70th week of Daniel has one goal. And that is to get the whole world to bend the knee and obey the man of sin in Rome. The papacy plans has been its plan from the very beginning to get every man, woman, and child on this planet to worship him as a god and every government of this world to obey him and to persecute the saints of the most high just like he's done for the last 15 1800 years depending on when you want to believe the when you want to you know put the start date for the papacy there has to be a reason why satan has caused god's people to forget what they knew, that the papacy is the Antichrist. And that's because Satan wants the papacy to be worshipped because the papacy is the son of perdition, not the son of God, not the vicar of Christ, but the son of perdition. The Judas priest, the one who betrays Christ with a kiss, is just like Judas Iscariot, pretends to be a friend of Christ, but he is his lethal enemy. Judas priest, the papacy. Okay? Judas Iscariot had a worldly counterpart. Okay? Type and anti-type. Judas Iscariot was the type of the man of sin who would eventually deceive the whole world. That is the papacy. Okay. That ought to be enough introductory for everybody. This is going to be a barn burner. We're going to see from the scriptures with our own eyes that Jesus was the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Look, we can't prove it in the scriptures. It's probably not true. So we're going to prove from the scriptures, like we've been doing ever since this series began. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. We are still in Hebrews chapter 10. I prepared the paper today a little bit longer. As you can see, we already have 38 pages that we need to go through. We are on page 21. Hebrews chapter 10 is the next part that we need to talk about because last time we spoke about the things in most of and for all in verse 11 and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins we spoke about the roman catholic mass we talked we talked about the uh, diabolical dogma of transubstantiation and how they are going to offer Jesus Christ over uh, to, to sacrifice uh, Jesus Christ over and over again and we are continuing today in verse 12 where it says but this man of course speaking of Jesus Christ after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God now what does that do to your sacrifice of the Roman Catholic Mass what does that do to your planned third temple in the diabolical state of Israel? Diabolical because it was founded by the initiative of Satan and of Satan's church and the sacrifices that they are going to put on there in that temple. What does that do to that when you read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12? This man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, you are going to deny him. Every Roman Catholic that takes the transubstantiational Jesus cookie in the Mass is denying that Jesus was and is the Christ. Because after he did that, he sat down on the right hand of God. Let me tell you, that doesn't mean that he sits on the throne, they're putting up his feet and uh, uh, doing nothing. That means when he sat down, that means that he is given power by God in heaven and that he has authority. And his authority you will see and feel and experience the moment when he comes back. And he will come back because he said so. We only do yeah. not know the time. 
we right. know that he comes, but we are not to set any dates. Jesus Christ said, no man knoweth the time or the hour when he comes back. Not even himself, only the Father who is in heaven. And that Father, he has the authority of now, while he sits with him in heaven and um, having all authority in heaven right now. And that authority he will bring back to earth when he comes. I think that Tom also has a comment on this verse 12. Oh, yeah. First of all, I'm going to go right back to keeping verse 11 and 12 in your mind. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the selfsame sacrifices, which can never take away sins. All right. If the priests of Israel were offering sacrifices, and they were, if those offerings of lambs and goats and doves and pigeons could never take away sins, we have to understand that only Jesus and his sacrifice, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, only his sacrifice could take away sins. Okay? So everyone in the history of the Jewish people who offered sacrifices for their sins to be forgiven, they had to know that the lamb, the dove, the, 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 the ram, or whatever they offered as a sacrifice was simply a typification of the Christ that would come and offer the final sacrifice, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And isn't that what Daniel's prophecy says? And he shall make a covenant with many for one week, that's seven years. And in the midst of the week, that is after three and a half years, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Jesus the Lamb of God, after three and a half years after being baptized by the River Jordan by John the Baptist, became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices and oblations. And to make sure that that stuck, that there was no other option for the Jews but to believe in the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the one that was hanging on the cross just outside the city gates, God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom and opened up the Holy of Holies. And what do you guess they found in the Holy of Holies when they ripped open that veil? When God ripped open the veil, the Ark of the Covenant was not there. It was not talked about. It was never seen after just before the Babylonian captivity. There was no mercy seat ever to offer the blood of the lambs and goats. Okay, no Ark of the Covenant. When the veil of the temple was ripped in twain from top to bottom, nobody died. Okay, that's because the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. Everybody knows the Ark of the Covenant was not mentioned for centuries before this time. Because it was not in the Holy of Holies. God took it away. So everybody knew. Nobody could doubt that there was absolutely no need to continue making animal sacrifices. Why? Because there was no mercy seat upon which to sprinkle the blood. It was a waste of time to continue animal sacrifices. Much better to believe in the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, still hanging on the cross outside the city gates. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world put all sacrifices and oblations to cease. All right? And, you know, a, a, an unbelieving Jew who just cannot and will not believe that Jesus took away their sins, reconciled them to God, made everlasting righteousness, opened a kingdom that will never end, what must they do? To, to have their sins remitted. What must they do? Well, they have to sew the veil of the temple back up. They have to pretend that the Ark of the Covenant is still there. They have to begin animal sacrifices again. Look, if they don't believe in Jesus, then they are without a sacrifice. That's what God intended. 
leave them no option but to believe in his son. They've already realized that the temple, that the Ark of the Temple was never there, at least since the, the destruction of, the, of, of uh, Solomon's temple at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Where did it go? Why continue to make sacrifice when atonement cannot be made with the Ark of the Covenant gone? You would think, you would have to believe that if the Ark of the Covenant remained in the Holy of Holies after the veil of the temple was rent, there would be some talk about it in the scriptures, would there not? No one, not one mention of it. Why? You've got to ask yourself the question. God doesn't answer all the questions. He wants us to ask the question, what about the Ark of the Covenant? What about the Ark of the Covenant? No mention of the Ark of the Covenant. Is it possible it wasn't there? Well, that sure answers the question, why was the Ark of the Covenant never mentioned? Since, since the destruction of, of the temple. Because it was gone. All right? And, and if Rome, even at that point, wanted to continue to phony, continue this, 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 this sacrificial system, God sent the Roman 10th Legion to destroy the temple so that not one stone of it remained. Okay? I think, Tom, no uh, I, I have to interrupt you here a little. Um, this is a picture taken from the Arch of Titus that is yeah. still standing today in the city of Rome. Yeah, uh -huh. That is what the Romans took from the temple yeah. when they destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Just the thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me why there is no Ark of the Covenant in here? Because it wasn't there. So we even have proof by the Arch of Titus that is still on display in Rome today that there was no Arch there, there are no Ark of the Covenant. That's right. Because we, uh, you spoke of the destruction of the temple, but to make sure that our listeners understand it correctly, we have to speak of the first destruction, the destruction mm -hmm. of the Babylonians before the Babylonian captivity in about 600 AD, so before yeah. uh, 600 uh, BC, so before BC. Christ came. Yeah. yeah? And uh -huh. then we have a second destruction, and from the second destruction we see the things are taken from the temple, but there is no Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. And I think that everybody knew that the Ark of the Covenant was the holiest of holies. They would have put that on display right here, but what do they put Certainly. on display in, in, instead? The menorah. Yeah. The seven candlesticks holder. That's Look, all. There's record. There's record in the book of Daniel uh, when they took the ba the, the uh, Israelites captive or the Judah uh, the house of Judah captive into Babylon, that they took the everything from the ark from the temple, but the ark of the covenant was never mentioned. Exactly. They didn't have the ark of the covenant either. Remember, uh, uh, Belshazzar was. Uh, uh, yeah, with his feast, a, where he used all the vessels. Uh, yeah, he had a drunken party. It was <clears throat> probably his birthday, his Babylonian birthday which Christians even celebrate to this day, that's strictly Babylonianism. No Christian, no no believer ever celebrated their own. That's a whole other subject. I don't want to get into it. Yeah, but it, I, I, the I, whole show. I absolutely look, am with but, you, Tom. Yeah. But, but, but look, they, they had a drunken party for Belshazzar, and they drank wine from the vessels of the temple. They, they desecrated the vessels of the temple, the articles of the temple, but nothing was said about the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because they didn't have it. Okay? It was not there. So before the Babylonian captivity, the priests of Israel did not have the Ark of the Covenant. They were making sacrifice. They were maintaining the ritual up on, the, on Temple Mount, but God had taken away the Ark of the Covenant. It was in safekeeping. It was not in the Holy of Holies. It was not behind the veil. It was not on Temple Mount. Okay? God protected it from falling into the hands of the Babylonians. That means he had to take it out of the hands of his own people. So they didn't have a place to offer the blood of the sacrifices. 
Okay? The blood of lambs and goats surely can't take away sins then, can it? Okay, that's just one reason why the blood of lambs and goats cannot take away sin. The other point is no animal can take away the sins of man. Only the Lamb of God. That's the point we need to emphasize. Only the Lamb of God could take away sins. And when his blood is sprinkled on the holy mercy seat of the temple in heaven, all sins are forgiven. Okay, reconciliation is made to God. Everlasting righteousness rules and reigns now. All of our sins are washed away, cast as far as the east is from the west. And uh, we're now one with Christ and the Father. Reconciliation is a done deal. Okay, Satan has been defeated. Christ's kingdom has replaced the kingdoms of this world. Now, why at that point would anybody make a sacrifice, whether it be the blood of an animal or, as in the case of the new Judaizers, the mass of the Roman Catholic Church, which they insist, and you must believe if you're Roman Catholic on pain of excommunication and eternal damnation, that the mass is the sacrifice of Christ afresh. The scripture plainly says, Jesus put all sacrifices and oblations to a permanent end. He said, it is finished. And therefore, we know anybody, anybody, whatever sect or denomination, whatever religion, if they make a sacrifice, they have denied Christ. That's just the simplest, most evident, in-your-face proof that that organization is an anti-Christ organization. So tell me, what in God's name are Christians, evangelicals, Protestants, denominations of every Christian sect are praying for the building of a temple and the initiation of animal sacrifices on Temple Mount? They're waiting for an antichrist, they say, now, remember, the papacy is the Antichrist, but they're waiting for an Antichrist <coughs> to come and make a peace treaty with the Jews for seven years that will enable them to build a temple to begin animal sacrifices again. The whole Christian world is on their knees praying that these priests, these so-called priests in Israel, can fulfill their priestly roles and offer sacrifices to the God that put all sacrifices and oblations to a permanent end. They've got to be deceived. That's the only con that's the only possibility. And they are deceived. Deceived beyond their ability to repent. That's the hideous reality. They are waiting for the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves, just like they did 2,000 years ago when they tried to continue animal sacrifices after the supreme sacrifice of the Lamb of God was done. They want the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves because that's what they do when they make a sacrifice. That's what a Roman Catholic does when he makes a sacrifice. He eats and drinks damnation to himself. You are not to believe anybody who participates in a sacrificial system. <coughs> of whatever denomination, whether it calls itself Christian or satanic or witchcraft or whatever, they, what do they all have in common? They make sacrifices, don't they? Okay, if you want proof positive that an organization is not Christian, all you have to do is find out if they make sacrifices. 
Daniel said he will make a covenant with many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, after three and a half years, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Jesus said it is finished. There was an earthquake. The sun went dark. The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. That curtain fell open and revealed a truth that is hard to deny. The whole sacrificial system was a sham, at least we know before the Babylonian captivity. No blood had fallen on the mercy seat for 600 years. Only the blood of Christ can take away sins. And he said, it's finished. I did it once. I did it for all. I did it for all time. Okay? The single combat warrior for mankind was Jesus Christ, and he took on the Goliath of Satan, and he destroyed him with one blow. He has no more hold over us. Christ is the victor. The war is over. No more sacrifices. If you do, you literally say you reject the blood of Christ. So why would any God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian want a Jew to drink a blood sacrifice to eat and drink damnation to himself? Why would any Bible-believing Christian wish to ecumenically unite with a Roman Catholic Church, the center of which is the Mass? The world, the whole Christian world, is deceived beyond comprehension. And it would have been so easy to avoid all of this hell if we'd have just remembered what we knew prior to about 1805. That is, that the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the beast, the Antichrist, is, was, and always will be the papacy. There is no future 70th week of Daniel. The only covenant that's going to be signed is a flying wonder to get you to eat and drink damnation to yourself, just like the Jews and the Roman Catholics. You see, this really is not so difficult, is it? And it makes far, far, far more sense than the futurist baloney they've been teaching us from the pulps of the churches since the early 1800s. You wonder why your government is so corrupt. You wonder why your Protestant liberties are being taken away from you and destroyed. You wonder why this world is in chaos because we've spit on the graves of all the of all the God-fearing saints whose blood has been shed for the last 2,000 years, telling the world, despite death threats, despite every opposition, Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. That's why they died. That's why they were persecuted, both by the papacy and by the governments of the, of the nations in which they lived. Their blood still cries to God from the ground. They want justice. But their day of justice is coming. But God's just waiting for us to come back to our senses. Come back to the truth. Then there'll be justice for the whole world. What do I have to do? What else can we do to make sense? But continue this study and show you from the scriptures that the 70th week of Daniel ended 2,000 years ago. The proof of that is that the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. It's been the responsibility of the Gentiles to preach the gospel ever since that time. And that's what we've done. But we've denied the truth that we knew was true. 
We have to return to Protestantism. We have to protest the man of sin. Yes, we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, but we all know also must warn the world that this papacy is the Antichrist. You want liberty? Then let Christ be King of kings and Lord of lords and not the man of sin in Rome. We've dropped the ball. It's our fault that we're suffering now, that the governments of the world don't, don't care about the people that righteousness does not and never will prevail in this world is because the man of sin is the king of kings and lord of lords and not Jesus the Christ. And we don't have to wage a war. We don't have to kill anybody. We don't even have to threaten anybody. We just have to tell people that Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, and we're not going to put up with any more government by the Pope. His Roman Catholic canon law is anti-Christ. The civil laws of this land, as they are fashioned under Roman Catholic canon law, are illegal. They are counter to the law of God. And our government must reform, just like Catholics did during the time of the Protestant Reformation. They reformed they reformed all of Europe. They led everybody out of the Roman Catholic Church. They led every government of Europe out of the Roman Catholic Church. They forced their governments to conform to biblical truth, biblical law, and shed the pretended power of the papacy, both spiritual and temporal. And if we, we don't, we, if we don't have the courage to do that, if we don't have the courage of the Protestant reformers just 500 years ago that liberated us, then we don't deserve any liberty. We deserve to have an awl poked through our earlobes and made a mark to serve the man of sin in Rome. So if your pastor doesn't tell you the truth about the historical 70th week of Daniel, kick him to the curb. Find yourself a Bible-believing Protestant to put behind the pulpit. you got to start there before you can ever reform the government. Don't even think or hope that the Democrats or the Republicans are going to repair the breach that has been caused between man and God because we believed futurism. No Democrat or Republican is going to serve Christ. They serve the Antichrist. Your hope is not politics. Your hope is Christ. If you restore Christ to the throne, King of kings and Lord of lords, then the governments of the world are going to have to reform, aren't they? No shots need to be fired. We just need to convince them that the man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan's vicar on the earth is the papacy. And if the government kowtows to him and obeys him and serves him, then we are going to pray against them all. Christ said, even greater exploits shall ye do. What do you think he meant when he said we would be able to move mountains? You know what a mountain in, Bible, in the Bible represents? A government. A government. Daniel's vision proved that the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands struck that image in the feet and became a mountain. Mountains in the Bible are governments. The governments of the world crumble when Christ is on the throne. We, it's our responsibility to put Christ back on the throne. And you can't do that until you get the futurist out from behind the pulpit. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah.
Thank you, Tom. It's always refreshing to hear you stating this over and over again until it probably sinks in into some new brains that are probably or hopefully are listening to these broadcasts and that we can bring to them the truth of Daniel's 70th week and Jesus Christ being the complete and perfect fulfillment of that 2000 years ago. And he still is. He fulfilled it then and because it is fulfilled we still feel that it is fulfilled today. And if we go against our feelings, well, we go into the Roman Catholic Church and, as you say, drink and eat damnation to ourselves. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says, From henceforth Jesus Christ expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Yeah? Relieving to, uh, relating to verse 12 that we read just before. For by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified. Now, this is also a very interesting little uh, verse because it says, He hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified. Those that are sanctified through Jesus Christ are the ones that he makes a covenant with. You remember the covenant that was spoken about in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27? He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Whom? Those who are sanctified. Those that believe and believed that Jesus was the Christ and is the Christ. For, one, for by one offering he, Jesus Christ, has perfected forever all them that are sanctified in him okay so if they're not perfected by him if they are not sanctified sanctified by him through his one offering for sin then what's what must the heathen do they must make their own sacrifices they must make their sacrifices over and over and over again it must be the centerpiece of their worship their sacrifice and isn't that what they're proposing to do on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, in a rebuilt temple? Isn't that what the Roman Catholic Church does every day in every Roman Catholic Church all over the world? They do. They eat and drink damnation to themselves because they are not sanctified, nor set apart, nor perfected by the blood of the single offering of Christ. 2,000 years ago. It's just as simple as that. It, it reiterates what I said before. If you see anybody make a sacrifice, they are not gods. They are not perfected. They are not set apart. They are not sanctified because they eat and drink damnation to themselves. They eat and drink that which is forbidden. Christ, the living sacrifice, once and for all sanctified by the blood of the Lamb of God. That's who are sanctified and perfected and set apart and saved. We don't make sacrifice. We simply remember the sacrifice that he made for us 2,000 years ago in the midst of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, the difference between the pagans or the heathen and the Christians is the Christians rely on Jesus Christ and the heathen, the pagan, rely on themselves. That's right. I mean, this is just a continuation, Tom. It is so easy, you know. It is just a continuation of what happened in the Garden of Eden. The serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field. And the serpent said to Eve, Yea, hath God said? Oh, you will surely not die. You will become as gods. It's about you. It's about what you make of yourself. It's never about what God makes of yourself, of what God can do when you are in God, when you are with God. As when you are a Christian with Jesus Christ, you don't need to do anything for yourself. Jesus Christ has done it all. It's that easy message. But you're always listening to the serpent. He has so nice words, doesn't he? 
Oh, he puts up this colorful little box in your living room and you have a little remote control and you press all the different channels yeah, because you are channeling, because you get programmed by programs and he is so subtly telling you that everything is wonderful and you don't have to care of anything and everything will be taken care of, blah, 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 blah. And you only have to rely on yourself. You are going to make it. That's what the teaching of this world is. And that is exactly what Satan, in the form of the serpent, told Eve in the Garden of Eden. So, in, in that regard, spiritually, I could always say, we, we never left the Garden of Eden. We are still in that same line. That's why Tom calls it so oftentimes the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. There's actually only this one deception, isn't that, Tom? It is. That's right. It is. It is the same deception. It is just. It, it's the same deception, but it is just changed in the in the in, in the in the wording through the time. But it's it's still the same. You can do it. I mean, it's Isaiah 14 all over again. I will exalt myself above the uh, above the clouds of heaven. I will sit also in the uh, in the congregation in the sides of the north, as Lucifer said in Isaiah chapter 14. And that's what this whole world all today is all about. And you can hear that everywhere. You see that in the television. You hear that in, in songs from your music. It is told you in the schools. You gonna make it. You, you, you. It's, it's, it's all about selfishness. It's all about us. It's never about Jesus Christ. It is never about the understanding that Jesus Christ did it once and for all, for all of us who accepted him. I mean, the truth is so easy and the lie is so complicated. That's why you have to study all your life in this damn system. <laughs> you know why you have to go 25, 30 years to school? Because the lie is so damn hard to understand. Where if the truth is so easy when you just open your Bible especially when you open the real true Bible, the 1611 King James Bible that we are opening here in our broadcasts always, a 10-year-old can understand it. A 10-year-old cannot understand the false teaching of a, uh, of a relativity, uh, theory of rel relativity from Einstein and all that stuff. But a 10-year-old can understand the Bible, can understand the Word, and can understand that mankind has been deceived once in the Garden of Eden, and that a part of mankind has been taken out of that lie, and they willingful fell back into that lie over and over and over again. And that record is in the Old Testament. Why did God have to send so many prophets to the earth? Why were there people like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like Elias, and all the other guys whose names I just don't know now, and it's not even necessary to, uh, to, to name them all? The point was always the same. They were pointing the finger at Israel and telling them that they fell back into paganism, that they fall back into the worship of Moloch, that they fell back into the worship of Baal, that they left the righteous path of the Lord their God, the Lord of Israel, who took them out of the captivity of Egypt. That's what these prophets were for. And these prophets were stating the word of God over and over again and telling the people, you are doing wrong. You are doing wrong. And it's been the same for thousands of years. Ever since man knew the truth, man has fallen away from the way of the truth. And Jesus Christ came and said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. So when you don't have Christ, you have somebody else. Well, this world teaches you have you. But you are in the spirit of Antichrist. Because you are in the spirit of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. What Lucifer said there in his rebellion in heaven. That's the point. Pride. Selfishness. And those are the sicknesses of this earth. 
And of those sicknesses, there is only one healing, and that's Jesus Christ. And the book of Hebrews is a wonderful place to go to, to understand that he became sin for us. He was sinless. He was the perfect fulfillment of all the law, because he was free of sin. But when he went to the cross, he became sin for us. And when we understand that, and when we believe in him, and when we profess him in this world, and when we teach him in this world, then we are of him, and we are saved. We are, our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, we are made white and we are made righteous only through him. Not before any Roman Catholic Church, not before any priest, not before any priest of the Roman Catholic Church or any priest in Buddhism or Shamanism or Hinduism or uh, any um, imam in the Muslim world or anywhere else, or not even a quote-unquote reverend or whatever they're going to call themselves in the Protestant churches. We are only made righteous before Jesus Christ because he had offered himself once and for all for all our sins and for by that one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now you just have to ask yourself the question, do you want to be sanctified in Jesus Christ? Then you have to accept Jesus Christ. You have to accept that he did this, what is written in the Bible all over again. It is written all over the New Testament. And we are just picking now Hebrews chapter 10. But I can tell you in the future, we will pick other places. We will pick from every gospel. We will pick from every epistle of Paul. We will pick from the, uh, from the letters of um, Judas and uh, James, and whatever we have there in the New Testament, and all over again you will see that Jesus Christ is the perfect and once and for all fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. It's an easy choice that you have to make. For by one offering Jesus Christ hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And how can you be sanctified? How can you be made righteous? through faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Right? That is the sentence that Martin Luther, that uh, put Martin Luther out of the Roman Catholic Church in the time. Let me just see if I can open up my Bible that I have here on my desk in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. That is a very, very important sentence and I don't want to Tear it apart by doing a wrong quotation. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. And you can only be made just through the acceptance of the one sacrifice that Jesus Christ made once and for all. Then you are made righteous. No other way, because the Bible says there is not one righteous, no, not one. In verse 15 we read, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds will I write them. This is the covenant that I will make with them. Tom, this is Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Right. And he confirms the covenant with many for one week. You can't have it more clear than in this saying of Hebrews chapter 10 verse right. 16, right? It's right out of Daniel chapter 9. And uh, that's why we say we're proving to you from the New Testament scriptures that the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy is over. It was over 2,000 years ago. It was seven years of time, beginning with Christ's baptism. Three and a half years later, he, he, he confirmed the covenant by shedding his own blood and made reconciliation to God. And he continued to confirm the covenant in his blood through his spirit-filled apostles, for a remainder of three and a half years, making 
altogether seven years. And when the Sanhedrin of Israel finally rejected Christ and stoned Stephen, the gospel went to the Gentiles, where it has been ever since. It is now us that spreads the gospel of truth all over the world because the Jews reject their Messiah. And they wish now to return to eat and drink damnation to themselves by making animal sacrifices which cannot take away sin, which are a stench in the nostrils of God Almighty, only salvation in Christ. There is no other sacrifice for sin, and uh, the whole Christian world is praying for this to happen. You, you can't get more messed up. You cannot get more messed up than the Christian world is today. And we must repent. All of us. Because we've all believed this lie. One permutation of it or another, we've all believed the lie. And the consequences is the consequences are incalculable. The spiritual damage that has been done to the body of Christ is incalculable because we believed the lie. We repeated the lie. Even though we didn't understand it, we repeated it and we believed it. The same lie that the serpent told Eve in the garden. Now we're told that we're going to make sacrifice just like the Jews, just like the Roman Catholics, and we're going to turn our memorial into a sacrifice. That's what they're going to make us do. Uh, the serpent said, Yea, hath God said in the garden. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And Jesus God said, Jesus said, said, I, said, I was the sacrifice once and for all. And what are we doing when we are going to the Roman Catholic Church and make our own sacrifice over there? We deny that sacrifice. We deny what right. God has said. Exactly as Eve denied what God has said in the garden, that when you eat of the fruit that you will die. Yep. I, I mean, from, from that you really see it is always the same story. It is wrapped in other paper, but it is the same story. Yeah. And in verse 15, well, I just put here in, in, in blue, underlined the uh, the text, for after he had said before, this is the covenant. Well, who, who said that? The archangel Gabriel in Daniel chapter 9, right. verse 27, right? And who right. is the archangel is Gabriel? He is the, an angel is a messenger, a messenger of God. He brings the word of God. So God said before, after I had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. That is also the way that it could have been written. That is the way that you should understand it because Jesus Christ promised you before that he will make a covenant with them that are sanctified, verse 14. Yes, sir. So, who are they that want to make sacrifice but them that are not sanctified by Christ? Exactly. The one and only sacrifice. They are the ones who eat and drink damnation to themselves. And they run our government. They run our churches. They run our government. They run everything. Why? Because no one opposes them. No one protests their heresies. I propose a new protestant movement in the world. And it must be led by those who understand Daniel's prophecy in, da in Daniel chapter 9. It must be led by historicists, those who believe and teach the historical fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, who proclaim unequivocally, with no contradiction, Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. And if that never happens, 
then the mountain that has overtaken this country will roll over it like a steamroller. And God's people again will shed their blood, become martyrs. What will Jesus find us doing when he returns? Will he find faith on the earth? It's up to us. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Exalt his name together, and let us exalt his name.